following message is from Church of Christ the King, based in Brighton and Hove in the UK. For more information about us, visit our website, cck.org.uk. Uh, my name's Joel, I'm one of the leaders here at Church of Christ the King, and uh, it's a privilege to speak to you from the Bible. I'm going to be reading, or at least we're going to be reading to you from uh, the book of Samuel in just a moment. We've been going through this book for a while, and we're in chapter 13. We did 14 last week, but I wanted to skip this passage. Well, we're coming back to it today. We're going to do the first 15 verses of chapter 13, and we're starting uh, to look intensely at a character in the Bible called Saul, because the story of his life is so instructive. There is so much to be learned. In fact, This is a lesson in how to ruin your life, how to get it completely wrong. He he actually ended up having everything he built his life up for taken away from him. Everything that uh, was given to him, he lost. And eventually he committed suicide. It's one of the most tragic stories, truly tragic stories in the Bible. But actually there's something more tragic about Saul than even his suicide. You might think, what could be worse than suicide? Well, ultimately, there is something worse, and that is failing to fulfill God's destiny for your life. And suicide, obviously, was part of that for him. It was, you know, fa- he failed so much that he got to suicide, but there was something even deeper, and that was that he, he had a destiny that God had set out for him, a plan that, that Saul was supposed to fulfill, but he actually didn't. And so, so his life is a warning to anybody, whether you're a Christian here today or, or if you're not a Christian and you're thinking, what, what about the, the future of my life? What's the, the point of my life? Why am I even here? Well, our message to you is that, that God knows you. He loves you. And actually, God plans things. God, God has destiny. And you could actually ruin the destiny that God wants to give to you. You could walk away from him so much. And I, I want to go through his life, therefore, pretty carefully and think, what are the lessons, what are the key ways in which he fails? And so that's the plan, and uh, we're going to start off, as I say, by reading the first 15 verses of chapter 13, which will come on the screen, and we'll just show a short video which will give, uh, give you some background as to the story. So let's watch it together. Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 42 years over Israel. Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and the hill country of Bethel, and a 1,000 with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear! And all Israel heard it and said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped at Michmash to the east of Bethaven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal and all the people followed him, trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me, 
and the peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, When I saw the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come with the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. Father, thank you for this book. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit who comes to take this book and apply it to our hearts. And we pray that that would happen this, this morning. We pray, Father, send the Holy Spirit amongst us to see the seriousness of who you are and to take you more seriously than we ever have and yet also to see the, the wonder of the gift of God to us in Jesus Christ so that we can see the hope laid up for us, so we can see the the prospect of forgiveness, the, the prospect of freedom, the prospect of uh, joyful pursuit of destiny. And I pray, God, be amongst us powerfully here today. Speak to us, Lord. We want to be touched and even transformed by the presence of God in the Word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the Bible teaches in the book of Hebrews that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith, it seems, is a, an absolute key. It's a decisive key in, in how we have dealings, how we relate to God. F faith basically means believing God. It means trusting him, taking him seriously enough to believe what he says implicitly and go along with him, uh, even putting our lives on the line to trust him. And that's actually how you become a Christian. The, the truth is that... The, by, by believing in Jesus, simply by taking one step of faith in Jesus Christ and saying, Jesus, I trust you for the forgiveness of my sins and for the securing of my friendship with God forever. That's how you get peace with God. That's how you come into God's family. That's how you become a Christian. You can become a Christian at once. You can become a Christian here today. You can be saved just by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's one place where in the Bible where precisely that, that happens. I mean, it's many places actually, but there's one place that's quite a remarkable example of it. A man who's a jailer uh, gets to a situation where he's terrified because there's been an earthquake and his prisoners have been set free because of the earthquake. Their chains have fallen off. Two of the prisoners are Christians, and they, they say, we haven't gone anywhere. Don't worry. We're still in prison. You're not going to lose your job. And, uh, and so he, he's stunned by it. He thinks, who are these people? They're, sh they're shocking people. They seem, to, they seem to be different to me. He noticed that they've been worshiping God in the middle of the night, and he says to them, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to have this forgiveness of sins, this joy that you seem to have? And maybe even today you're here thinking, you know, do you people look joyful you, you look like you've found something, you've got something that's given you liberty and hope and freedom. What is that? How do you get that? And the answer that these men give to the jailer is very simple. They say, you can look it up in Acts chapter 16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. 
very simple. They don't say, look, if you try this, if you work hard at that, if you really give it your best, if you, if you go to church regularly, if you go through a whole system of disciplines and hard work, then maybe you'll be saved. No, no, no. They simply say, believe on the Lord Jesus. You will be saved. And so he does. It's that simple. It can be incredibly swift. The problem is that Christians can often get saved quickly by, by applying that kind of faith, but, but fail to see that to press on in the Christian life, to fulfill the destiny that's upon our lives, we need to continue to apply faith. We need to continue to exercise faith in God. That faith that saved us should give birth to ongoing, prevailing faith that achieves other things. You are not just brought into the Christian life so that you can go to heaven in an armchair and just, just allow life to drift past because, well, I'm saved, so it doesn't, I don't need to achieve anything more. No, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, we are foreordained, that means planned, for good works that God had in store. There, there's a destiny. There are things God wants for you to do. Distinct things, exciting things. There are even things God wants us to do as a church. It applies corporately together. There's things, there's a destiny over Church of Christ the King. There's a destiny over churches, and churches can either prevail in faith, carry on trusting God to see all the things that they were called to do fulfilled, or they can shrink back after hitting what the Bible calls trials. So, so when we get saved, there's this moment of incredible joy and liberty because we know I'm safe in my Father's house. I'm forgiven my sins, and it's completely true. You can know that you're secure. You can know that you're forgiven. And yet, friends, there is more even than that to be achieved in God. And for us to fulfill God's plan for our lives means we have to push through what the Bible calls trials. Trials come in all kinds of ways. And actually, just to refer to one passage in the New Testament that describes this kind of thing, uh, there's, uh, I'll just back it up with 1 Peter chapter 1. This is one of Jesus' close friends, perhaps his closest friend when he was walking on planet Earth. He had a, a friend called Peter who wrote towards the end of his life a couple of letters that are in the New Testament. And Peter, Peter puts it like this in his letter. He says this, In this, in, in the hope that you have, you rejoice Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's saying, listen, your faith, it may not seem the most valuable thing in your life sometimes, He's saying, believe me, your faith is more precious than gold, more precious than anything that you could aim for in this world. To, to continue in trust, to go on believing God in spite of things, well, that means that you can get through trial after trial, and it will result in spectacular, spectacular fruitfulness, spectacular success for the kingdom of God, spectacular blessing in, in the church, in the city, in the world. But these things don't come for free. They don't come without trials. For God to really use us, we need to be prepared to say, God, we will trust you through trials. It's always been his way with people that he uses significantly and it will be his way. And King Saul is going through a trial in this passage. And I want us to just briefly look at the nature of his trial. And I want to look at how he failed it, and his response, and how we can avoid the same mistake. And really, this, this story that we have in chapter 13 lists a few different features of trial. They're different challenges to his faith. So let's just look at them very quickly. I'm going to go through these fast. I want to move on to some of the things Afterwards, There are four challenges to Saul's faith that we can see here. Verse 5, it says this. The Philistines, that's the is Israel's enemies at this time, mustered to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Avon. Now that is intimidating opposition. So many, you couldn't number. It felt like... 
an innumerable amount, just this vast army, like the sand on the seashore. And by the way, that, that phrase, like the sand, that should remind you, if you know uh, the Old Testament well, you'll know in Genesis, when God speaks about his people, he says, Abraham, your children, your descendants, will outnumber the sand. It'll be like the sand. And it's as though there's, there's such a terror in Saul's heart when he sees this huge army. All of the promises that seem to be for Israel, for his people, they seem to be being fulfilled for the Philistines. They look numerous. They look dangerous. They look like God's with them, not with us. And so Saul's trembling. He feels opposition. But this is a huge thing. You see, the Bible says in, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says this, No trial has come to you except that which is common to man. In other words, the troubles, the challenges, as we're calling them here, the four challenges I'm listing, they're typical. They're classic challenges. No one can say, well, of course, my situation was different. I mean, everybody gets trials, but my trials were so specially hard that I think God should let me off the hook. I'm a special case, because <laughs> if you could see what I went through. But, but, but. The Bible says the opposite. It says there's no temptation that's come upon you, no trial that's come upon you, except that which is common and normal. They're things that are common. And, and therefore, the trial of opposition is a common one. It's a common feature of life with God to face opposition. If you, if you want to follow Jesus, and some of you, you're deciding today whether you want to follow Jesus. In a sense, we all are every day. Every day. To choose to follow him means you open yourself up to the certainty of opposition. You will be opposed. You will be faced with adversity. And the response of our heart is so telling. The way that we deal with that adversity. Do we let it shape us? Do we let it bully us into submission? Do we let it cause us to give up? To throw in the towel? Jesus promised it. He says, in this life you will have trouble. We don't put those verses on laminated posters, but they are in the Bible. And, and they must be, at least in laminated posters, in our own minds. Otherwise, we'll be conning ourselves all the time. God, help me to be prepared for the promise that you made. That Not just disappointment, which we'll come to in a second, but, but actual, sometimes vitriol, sometimes words, sometimes physical threats, actual abuse, actual opposition. Why? Well, the Bible teaches that history is the story of a war. There's a war going on. There has been since the beginning of the story. You go right back to the first couple of pages. There's a war between God and an enemy, between God and evil. And evil is very active. Evil is very busy. It's even personified in a person, the devil who we make cartoons about, and then we say, well, we don't believe in him because that's just cartoonish. Well, put the cartoon out of your mind for a bit. There really is an evil force, a person, who wants to destroy anybody who lines up with Jesus Christ. When you became a Christian, presuming you became one, you made an enemy, a fierce one. And to, to be prepared for fierce opposition is to be wise. That's why it says in the book of First Corinthians, that, Take heed lest any fall. And, and Peter says later on in his letter, your enemy, like the devil, roars like a prowling lion. He's real. And the question would be, how do you respond to the opposition of this warrior? How do you, how do you see him? Saul's response when he sees the opposition of the Philistines, this evil army who are oppressing God's people and totally against the kingdom of God, is to panic, is to lose his sense of perspective completely. He's, he's so impressed with the enemy that he's failed to be impressed with his God. He's, he's fearing the enemy more than he's fearing God. And Jesus said to his disciples, I will tell you who you should fear. Don't fear those who can destroy your body. Fear instead the one who has the power after your body's destroyed to throw you into hell. There's someone much more, much more dangerous, much to be taken far more seriously than all of the enemies that the world can muster combined. 
Saul's, Saul's lost perspective. He's, he's gone in his mind, this clouded sense of the enemy, the enemy. They've intimidated him to the point where he's lost his confidence, he's lost his trust. He's stopped trusting and believing God. There's opposition about. And, and so his prayer, his plea later on when he makes the sacrifice he shouldn't have made is really, God, please come and help me in my situation. I'm in terrible danger. Can't you see there's a terrible enemy? You obviously don't care about my situation. And when we face trouble, whether it's a, a, an army, whether it's physical danger, whether it's opposition at work, whether it's trouble uh, uh, in our family, whether it's even in the town as people speak against Christianity, as the culture uh, can get increasingly more secularized and speak out forcefully against the Christian faith in a quite an unprovoked kind of way, we can start to shrink our perspective down to, God, come and help. Can't you see? Can't you see how hard it is, God? There's a place in the Gospels where Jesus' disciples are in a boat And the waves come battering at this boat as a huge storm erupts. And it looks as though the boat is going to capsize. They're all going to go down and drown. And Jesus is in the boat asleep. And they wake him up and say, don't you care? Don't you care? And if you know the story, Jesus gets up and literally tells the storm to stop. Just stands up on the deck of a boat. I mean, imagine this. It is awesome stood in a storm at night time and said, stop, be quiet. Actually, the word in the Greek is be muzzled, which is like you know, putting a muzzle on a dog that won't stop yapping and biting. And it just, the Bible says it stopped, the waves went down, the sea was like glass. And they were terrified of him. They, they got perspective again. They were scared of the storm, the storm, the storm, and suddenly... It says they trembled. They learned who to fear. And Jesus turns to them and rebukes them and says, why didn't you trust me? Where's your faith? You know, when you hit opposition, ultimately the question isn't how bad is the opposition, how big is it, but whose side are we on? It's actually a better question to say, that. whose side are we on? Not whose side is God on. God, are you with us? That's what Joshua asked a soldier, when he was about to go in to fight the biggest battle of his life against the, the biggest city known to man, Jericho, with walls up to heaven. And Joshua was terrified. He's thinking, how are we going to fight Jericho? And he walks and he sees this soldier in the distance. He walks up to him, this lone soldier with his sword drawn on a hillside near the camp. And he says to him, who are, are you with us or with them? And the soldier says, no. Which is a totally... It's like a politician's answer, isn't it? What, 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 what does that mean? Are you with us or with them? No. Nope. Wrong question. I'll tell you who I am. I, I am the captain of the armies of the Lord. And I have come. And perspective changes because, oh, it's not about whether he's on my side. It's whether I'm on his side. Oh, I'm on his Oh, so I need to just sort of almost get out of the way. Saul had begun to think it depended on him completely. I've got to win this battle. I'm the king. It's a terribly difficult job being king. How do you do it? And if you've experienced the responsibility of leadership in any kind, you'll know exactly how that feels. And if you haven't, trust me. Oh, I've got to do this. I've got to look like I'm in charge. I've got to, I've got to muster it. How am I going to make us win? You have to go back to God and say, I'm sorry for thinking it was my battle. It's not my battle. It's your battle. It's God's battle. Friends, the battle that you're facing in your life against evil, against intimidation, against bullying, I don't know, maybe a boss, maybe a a family member, I don't know what kind of opposition we're facing all across the room, all across the city. How are you handling it? Are Are you seeing it as... God, or are you seeing it as under God's control? So you've got to face opposition. We've got to face it and be prepared for it. It's one of the many challenges to faith. Let's look at the second one that he faces. You see there in verse 5, the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots. But then it says in verse 6, when the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, the people were hard-pressed, 
the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and cisterns. Well, isn't that just great? (laughs) Thanks a lot, guys. Here I am facing the biggest disaster of my life, the biggest military challenge I will ever face, hopefully. And that's the point my army suddenly goes to lunch. Suddenly, suddenly, there's something good on TV. Suddenly, you know, I've got to get home, but, you know, Downton Abbey or Spooks or whatever it is. And so, I'm sorry, Saul. I, you know, we love you. We really do love you. But right now, we hate you. <laughs> in your all intents and purposes, you got us into trouble. We're getting out. The second challenge to faith is betrayal. When people let you down, you trust in people and you regret it. And I promise you, it will happen to you in some way. If you follow Jesus, no temptation has overcome you except that which is common to man. It's common. To follow Jesus means to get treated like Jesus. He got opposed, he got betrayed. King Saul Opposition, betrayal. And opposition's hard because people you don't know are coming at you. But when it's someone you do know, someone that you love, someone that you've you've made yourself vulnerable to, you've given some things away to them. (sighs) Wow. It, It cuts a little deeper. And it provokes a terrible soul-searching. If they're not confident in me, then why should I be confident in me? If they're going, if they're leaving, if if they've spoken against me, if they've used my words against me and slandered me and gossiped against me, what's the point? Why carry on the show? I guess that's precisely how Saul's beginning to feel. Just... I, what's, what's the point? I mean, people are leaving me. You can feel that it's the last word. Really, betrayal, it can be a helpful way of indexing just how much we've become dependent on people. Ultimately, we're so dependent on others. We've, we've started to need them in a way that actually we need to need God. Obviously, we do need each other. That's why it hurts so much. When people let you down, wow, that's painful. But this is the thing. Jonathan, in the next chapter, as we read last week, is doing the precise opposite. Do you remember it says in in chapter 14, he and his armor bearer, two men, go to fight the Philistine garrison. And Jonathan's words are, The Lord is able to save, whether by many or by few. Just a couple of guys, I trust God. Trust him. I just do. There's a perspective there. There's a liberation there. There's a sense, you know what? They may have lost confidence. I haven't lost confidence in God. I don't have much confidence in myself, but I know my God has called me. I know my God is with me. I know I can press on because God has made me promises. And I'll be faithful to those. And so we, we need to be watchful. We need to be careful about how we respond to betrayal. There's so much more we could say about that. And obviously that's why we preach every week instead of just one week. Because we can touch on this in years and years to come. But this is a massive thing. Friends, ultimately it does come down to where we place our hope and our trust. Let's look at the third thing, delay. Delay. You can see it right there. In, uh, let's get to the, the place in verse 8. Saul's waited seven days. The time appointed by Samuel. So Samuel has said to him, Saul, wait seven days. Whatever you do, don't do anything till I'm there. You wait there, Gilgal, for seven days. Trust me, trust me. I speak for God. I am the prophet here. I am a judge of Israel. I am to be trusted. Wait seven days. And Saul waits for what seems like seven days, the time appointed, and Samuel hasn't shown up. To some way into the seventh day. And Saul's now facing this crisis of confidence. Instead of thinking, I've got to wait for the whole day to be out, he, he just thinks, look, it's, it's no good. I, I, I just, I've, 
he hasn't come. And I guess, it's, it's, again, it's a common temptation. When you face delay, when the promise doesn't seem to come through in the time you need it to, or you think you need it to. And God says, trust me, obedience will yield good results. Disobedience will not. But we, we find that we've obeyed him for so long, and he hasn't come through for us. Maybe you've wrestled with God, to, 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 to waited for God to come. Look, we've waited maybe for years for something to happen, but it's never happened. And we've trusted that God would do it. And we know that he said he'd do it, but he just hasn't. Delay can be excruciating, especially if it seems indefinite. When will God come? Well, it's a funny thing in the Bible. One of the phrases that the Bible is quite fond of using is the phrase, in a little while. Do you notice that? You see it in the book of Hebrews, the book of Haggai, and in the Psalms. In 1 Peter again, chapter 1 and chapter 5. In a little while, trial will be over. In a little while, the Lord of peace will comfort you. I want to know exactly how long a little while is, don't you? How little? What's a while? You know, give me digits. God doesn't do that usually. Very rarely does he give dates. Sometimes people like to prophesy dates. They're usually wrong. Usually wrong. If anyone ever says to you, the Lord says on date X this will happen, they are likely to be wrong. Of all the kinds of prophecy that come. There are many kinds of prophecy that just, I just take less seriously than others. Because dates are usually wrong. As well as you're called to marry me, the Lord says. That's also wrong. <laughs> okay? Dates, you just don't know the time and you don't. Even Jesus, when his disciples said, when are you going to come back then? I don't know. Even Jesus didn't know. And yet we know everything about when this should happen and when that should happen. This is the plan. This is how it will happen. And, you know, we set up our five-year plans. Good thing. Do that. Well done. Good to be intentional. It is good to be intentional. But please do it humbly. Please let God be God with the timings, with the seasons. Oh, God, help us. Help us when we hit delay. Help us when we hit disappointment. Help us when multi-site is going really, really badly, which it will sometimes. Multi-site isn't the answer. Jesus is the answer. It's great that multi-site is getting us into a new era. I'm more excited than any of you, trust me. But it's not the answer. It will disappoint you if you put all your eggs in that basket. All kinds of things will disappoint us. We have to trust in the God rather than in the times and seasons that we set. Nevertheless, actually, in this case, Saul has been given a time. Seven days. He's been given a time. Of all, what a blessing. What a privilege. Yet it's still not good enough for him. So he, he starts to panic. He starts to feel so disempowered. Where's, where's Samuel? He hasn't shown up. Have you waited? Have you I tried that. Sometimes we do that. I think maybe in our culture we're particularly prone to this. I tried praying. It didn't work. I tried praying. Have you prayed about it? I tried praying. It didn't work. Well, of course it didn't work. Praying doesn't work. It's not like a, it's not like a flipping microwave. <laughs> it's, praying is humbly saying, God, you are God. And if you don't do what I ask you to, I still trust you, and I'll keep asking. Even if you, you know, maybe you'll stop me asking, but whatever it is, you are God. I don't give you a chance. I humble myself. God, I'm in your hands. Praying doesn't work in that sense. Trust me, it really does work. But it doesn't work like a slot machine or a kettle. Praying, praying is to humble yourself before God. Saul's failing to do that. He's feeling disempowered, so he thinks, well, I've got to act. And so he does what the, uh, the last challenge opens him up to. The last challenge is escape routes. When, when trusting God has become too difficult, so we look for the, we lunge for the escape hatch, the escape option. And we do this in all kinds of ways. In, in Saul's case, he does it religiously. He says, let's, well, let's have a sacrifice. Let's, let's try out a sacrifice. That's his way of trying to you know, be religious in his disobedience. It looks really good. looks really spiritual. And people do that. People do things that are frankly unbiblical and then say, well, I've prayed about it. I sought the Lord. I, I, I've prayed about it. 
well, you probably shouldn't have even prayed about it. To have even asked God for permission to do what you did was blasphemous. Shouldn't have done it. And we do this in so many ways. God, God I, I, I just, I just, I just, I'm going to break the rule here just a little bit. I'm going to, do you know what? I find as a pastor this happens so often in relationships. So often when it comes to romantic relationships, whether it's divorce, whether it's marriage. I touch on this a lot because frankly it comes up so much. The, the non-Christian who, who we're pursuing because, well, I, I tried waiting. I tried waiting for the right Christian, but I felt I just couldn't wait any longer. And there's this escape option of this other person. So we step out knowing, do you know what, in your conscience it's wrong, but maybe, maybe we do it anyway. And we, so we pray about it. We say, oh, well, I, pray about, I prayed about it and the Lord didn't, didn't kill me, so it must be all right. Maybe God's kindness is supposed to lead you to repentance. Guys, be careful of escape routes that are just quick lunges. Be humble before God. So a lot of our faith is expressed in simple plodding, actually. <laughs> pressing through faithfully. Sometimes for years, God, we just plod. We keep pressing on faithfully. We take big steps. We take big risks. We do Jonathan and his armor bearer things. We're going to be a radical, faith-filled excited people, but a lot of the time, our faith is expressed in humble trust through seasons of delay and refusal to take easy options that actually are sin. They're not always sin. Some easy options are just God's gifts to us. But that's why we need to really know, truly, through the scriptures, what, what is right? What is, the, what is the, the right way to go? So there are some challenges that Saul faces. Samuel comes along right at the time when Saul has just blown it. Isn't it, isn't it shocking? So often we, we, we take steps of unbelief because we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, and we say, can't wait any longer, and then we find out, if I'd waited for two minutes longer, <laughs> everything would have been different. Oh, gosh. Sometimes, sometimes we're so, oh, gosh, it's tragic. I mean, it, is, it reads like a, it's like a, Shakespeare, it's like that moment where Juliet wakes up and Romeo's just taken the poison. Oh, no. Samuel's here now. Oh, no, what have I done? Funny thing is, Saul doesn't say that. He doesn't say, what have I done? I think if he did say that, things would be very different. He doesn't. What does he say? Samuel comes along and he says, what have you done? What have you done? And Saul's answer, verse 11. When I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, see what he's doing? He's, he's wriggling. He's wriggling like a fish on a hook. He's, no, 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 no. No, 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 this isn't my fault. This isn't my fault. They're a big army. My soldiers are leaving. And to cap it all, frankly, you didn't turn up. You didn't do your side of the bargain, Samuel. So don't you dare come wagging your finger at me. It's your fault, not mine. Wow. So, so basically, Saul doesn't even see his error. Before God... He was instructed to wait. And before God, he's not waited. At this trial, at this hurdle, he failed. But instead of showing a repentant attitude, instead of saying, God, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done. What have I done? He gets defensive. And do you know what? This is, this is the story of the human race. From the very beginning. When God comes looking for Adam in the garden, the man and the woman who've disobeyed, who've taken fruit from a tree, they were told, do not touch that. Do not, trust me, trust me. You don't want to touch that. Just trust me. I love you. Well, they failed their trial, their test. But when God comes looking, where are you? What's going on? Why did you take the fruit of the tree? Well, I, it was the woman that you gave me. And she says, well, it was the snake. I, it was, it, it, you, 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 I don't, you gave me this woman. In other words, it's her fault. It's the snake's fault. Frankly, it's your fault. 
It's your fault that I sinned. It's your fault that I've messed my life up. Listen, if that mentality is at the heart of human wickedness, that the shirking off of responsibility, the desire to blame shift so that God takes the rap for all our wrongdoing, can I ask you to consider for yourself, are there times when actually that's precisely what's going on with you? Saul is being a classic, angry, arrogant young man who cannot be rebuked, who cannot be corrected. Because his, his, his world has been reduced to his own reputation, his importance. And now that someone's come along to diss him, he reacts with you know, this sinister pride. But it doesn't look sinister here. But think about what he's doing, friends. Think hard about what he's actually doing. It's, it's the cancer that's at the heart. This isn't my fault. I'm not going to face it. I'm not going to apologize to God. I'm not going to confess my sin. I'm not going to do that. Because I will not let my life revolve around him. My life revolves around me and how important I am. And frankly, you know, that's kind of the, man, the culture that we live in as well, as, as is remarked on by so many politicians since the riots in August. The mentality where the world is there to revolve around you, your rights. You raise a generation of people who know their rights but not their responsibilities. And, the papers and the politicians are saying it as if it's new. It's not new. It's been in the Bible for centuries, for thousands of years. It's right there in the heart. It's sort of got worse in the last 30, 40, 50 years perhaps, but it's been there all along. It's been there all along. It's not, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. I know my rights. You can't say it to me. You can't say it to me. And it gets so annoying when it's people who actually... They come along and say, oh, if only someone would take me seriously. If only someone would train me. You hear this from guys in the church even, young guys. If only someone would, would look after me and father me and, and, and train me and, and help me and develop me. Okay, let's develop you. Let's talk about stuff in your life. No, 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 you can't say that to me. You can't sin for dust because you've just started to pick on things in the heart that no one wants to talk about. No, 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 no. But I want someone to take me seriously. Well, maybe that's the problem. <laughs> You're much too interested in taking yourself seriously. Stop it. No one else is. We were trying to take him seriously. But Saul's taking himself seriously. So he responds, he reacts with this kind of ugliness. Guys, we've we, we got to check our hearts at least. We've got to be real, guys. This is, this is the disease. How do you deal with it? How do you, how do you respond with a humble, sensitive heart? Well, not the way that he does. He's, he's quickly blame-shifting. But then, look, I wonder, and I just wonder if there's a sense in which it's not attractive to him to repent. In fact, I don't wonder. It's kind of obvious. He, he doesn't see the point in repenting. He doesn't see the point in humbling himself. He doesn't see it because he doesn't see God. He hasn't seen the man in the boat saying to the storm, be still. He hasn't seen the man with his sword drawn outside the walls of Jericho. He hasn't seen that God. He's only seen the troubles. And so when he's, he's facing the wrath, instead of throwing himself on the mercy of God, he's not even noticing God. If he was noticing God, he would see that there's a way through. He wouldn't be so defensive. He wouldn't be so quick to blame shift. He wouldn't say, well, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going through, Samuel. You don't know how hard it's been for me. Isn't that, isn't that the way we talk to God? You don't know how hard it is for me. Life's hard. The Christian life is it's too hard, frankly. It's just too hard. Yeah, I, I, I liked it at first, but it's just getting too difficult. I just I give up. Or at least I kind of give up. I kind of Give up in my heart, but I carry on on the outside so I don't get in trouble. But really, I stopped trusting God years ago. It's just hard. You don't understand how hard it is. God, you don't understand. You've never been here. You've never felt what I feel like. You've never felt my trials and temptations. How wrong we are. This is one of the, the main points of a book in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. But I'll read to you from it. Hebrews was written partly to deal with that whole way of thinking. See, see, Hebrews is written by someone who's caring for a church that's going through terrible difficulty, hardship. 
and they're facing a trial that it looks like they might fail. They might blow it. And so the writer says in chapter 3, he's trying, to, he's trying to help them to think straight, to get it right in the way that they approach God. I'm sure I should say chapter 2. Talking about Jesus, it says, Therefore the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not angels that he, that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Now listen to this, verse 17. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, when tested, when tried, as you are tried, he's able to help those who are being tempted, those who are on trial. See, listen, let me finish by saying this. If you see God as this kind of solid, impervious mass of divinity, this kind of thing out there somewhere who's utterly insensitive to what you're going through, doesn't know how hard it is and frankly doesn't care. And of course, when you hit trouble, hardship, opposition, betrayal, delay, easy escape routes, you'll take them. You'll take those routes as soon as you see them because, well, there's no other hope. Who else can I run to? But the Hebrews writer is saying this, this is the thing. You don't realize who you can run to. In Jesus, you have someone who knows from experience every trial. He went through it for you. He faced the worst opposition the world could muster. The crowd shouting for his blood. Crucify him. Crucify him. Everybody, all the power mongers in Jerusalem knew he was going to die. He's going down. Terrible opposition. He hasn't got a chance. And you talk about betrayal. All of his followers left, including the ones who promised, I'll never leave. Departed, denied him, ran away. You talk about delay. Well, actually, for Jesus, delay is almost the wrong word because deliverance never came. Deliverance never came. He went through to agony and died. And he was offered escape routes. Wow, was he offered escape routes. He had the devil come to him and say, if you fall down before me, I'll give you the nations. I'll give you everything you ever dreamed of if you follow me. So many escape routes, so many options, so many offers. Jesus faithfully endured them all. He endured every trial without sin. But that doesn't mean that he now stands on the throne and says, well, I did it. Come on. I know life's hard for you, but look what I did. Come on. No, that's what he's saying. He's able now to sympathize with you. He, simply, he watches what you're going through. He says, now listen, I'll give you grace. That's why he says in chapter 4 of Hebrews, he says, let us approach the throne of grace, mercy, grace to help in time of need. Are you facing a time of need? Saul was facing one, but he didn't see the throne of grace. Maybe he only saw a throne of judgment. Maybe he only saw a throne of God saying, prove yourself, Saul. Now let's see what kind of a king you are. Prove yourself. Maybe that's the, the God he saw. I tell you, the God of the Bible says this. You don't need to prove yourself. You don't need to face this trial on your own and beat it all on your own. No, 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 no. Look to me for grace. I'm with you. I can be trusted. Look at the, look at the wounds in my hands and feet. You can trust me. So you face panic. Look to Jesus Christ. 